My name is Beth Lander, late of the College of Physicians of Philadelphia and now the Managing Director of the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries. I'm also the treasurer of the Medical Heritage Library. I'd like to introduce two people to you today. Our first presenter is Jonathan S. Jones, who is the inaugural postdoctoral scholar in Civil War history at Penn State's George and Ann Richards Civil War Era Center in 2020-2021. <clears throat> Excuse me, where he is currently preparing a book manuscript on opiate addiction in the Civil War era for publication. The project is derived from his dissertation on the same topic defended at Binghamton University in June of 2020. Jonathan's recent publications include an article in the Journal of the Civil War Era's June 2020 issue entitled, Opiate and Slavery, Civil War Veterans and Opiate Addiction. After Penn State, Jonathan will be joining the Department of History at Virginia Military Institute as an assistant professor of Civil War history starting in August of 2021. His contact information will be shared in chat in just a moment. <clears throat> Our second speaker will be Whitney Arnold, who is the adjunct assistant professor of comparative literature and director of the undergraduate research center for the humanities, arts and social sciences at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her research and publications focus on self narratives and autobiographical texts in 18th and 19th century Britain and France, as well as literary history and theories of authorship. Her current project is an analysis of narratives of health and medicine in 18th and 19th century autobiographical texts. And now I'll turn things over to Jonathan Jones. Thanks Beth for that introduction and thanks everybody for joining us. Um, hopefully the audio is okay. And if not, please let me know in the chat. Uh, Beth is sharing my contact info and I'm more than happy to talk about any of the uh, you know, any of the questions that might come up during my presentation. So feel free to send me an email or put your questions in the chat. And I will begin by sharing my slides. So the US is, as uh, we all know, in the grip of a massive opioid addiction crisis. Since the late 1990s, when the crisis began until now, millions of Americans have struggled with addiction to drugs like Oxycontin, uh, heroin and fentanyl, and hundreds of thousands of people have died from opioid overdoses in the U.S. just in the last five years alone. Um, it, the crisis shows no signs uh, of slowing, so it's actually getting worse over time. And in fact, it's likely that COVID-related lockdowns in the U.S. have actually increased the, the overdose um, rate. Uh, as a historian, I, I'm always struck by the fact that the opioid crisis is consistently framed in the news and, and sort of talked about as if it's something new, as if um, an addiction epidemic has never happened before in the US and is in some way unique to modern America or the conditions of life in the US today. But as it turns out, this is not the case. In reality, the US has a long history of opioid crises. Um, 150 years ago, the Civil War actually caused America's original opioid crisis, although it's been pretty much forgotten uh, until now. In the Civil War's wake, so between um, 1865 and, and roughly the year 1900 in the US, thousands of Civil War veterans became addicted to medicines, opiate medicines like morphine, opium, and laudanum. They, they became, uh, these men became to use sort of the parlance of the day, opium slaves or enslaved to opium. Uh, and like addicted Americans today, Civil War veterans who suffered from opiate addiction endured overwhelming suffering uh, because of, of their condition. The drugs ruined men's bodies and reputations. They destroyed their livelihoods and strained family relationships. Um, they brought, uh, addict addiction brought men into contact with law enforcement and the carceral state, much like today. It left men exposed to predatory medical fraudsters. Some of that we'll, we'll talk about here in just a moment. Um, addiction robbed veterans of military entitlements. It led to their commitment to mental institutions. And above all, it resulted in thousands of overdose uh, uh, deaths. And a lot of that sounds familiar if you've been sort of watching the news cycle coming out of today's opioid crisis. Um, so in my talk today, I'm going to present research derived from my book manuscript, which is tentatively titled Opium Slavery, Veterans and Addiction in the American Civil War Era. And it unpacks this history of, of opiate addiction in the U.S. Civil War era. Um, my manuscript, which is currently under revision, is actually the first full-scale full study of Civil War America's addiction crisis. 
And the project uncovers uh, a few different elements of, of this um, crisis uh, dating from the, the Civil War, like the vast scale of drug addiction among Civil War veterans. It, it investigates their lived experience. What was it actually like to live with an opioid uh, addiction 150 years ago? Um, and also the, the radical and really surprising responses of the American healthcare sector and the government to the veterans uh, addiction crisis. Now, the Medical Heritage Library and other mass digitization projects loom large in my research. Uh, in fact, without the Medical Heritage Library in particular, my research would have been literally impossible, so I would not have a book manuscript at all. Uh, that's how much I owe to the digitization work that's been done by MHL. Uh, so with that in mind, I have two main uh, objectives here today for this talk. First, I wanna share just a handful of the key findings from my book manuscript. And second, and I think most importantly for our purposes, I'm gonna unpack exactly how the Medi Medical Heritage Library and mass digitization has enabled this research. Uh, and I'll point to some specific illustrations. The kind of qualitative research that I've had to do for my book has been impossible previously prior to the mass digitization of 19th century American medical sources, which has occurred over the last uh, decade. So what I wanna do is essentially illustrate how I've benefited from the Medical Heritage Library in the hopes that other scholars of 19th century America can also see um, surprising ways to use the Medical Heritage Library's amazing resources and data. But let's start at the beginning. How did the Civil War cause an epidemic of drug addiction? Um, <clears throat> opiates were 19th century America's most commonplace medicines. They were everywhere in the Civil War era. Uh, opium and its derivatives, which included medicines like laudanum and morphine, which are both liquid preparations uh, of opium, basically. These were powerful medicines that were used throughout the 19th century in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe also to relieve pain uh, and to treat various medical symptoms or health symptoms like diarrhea, fatigue, coughing, things like that. Opiates in the U.S. were present in somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of all prescriptions during the Civil War era. So they were everywhere. Doctors doled them out. Um, you know, very, very frequently. And there were also no narcotics regulations uh, of any kind on opiates or, or other drugs during this time period in the US. So you could walk into a general store or a pharmacy in most parts of the country and just buy them over the counter. You didn't even need a prescription. Um, naturally, prescriptions and self-medication sometimes led to uh, opiate addiction before the Civil War. <clears throat> Occasionally, Major 19th century American medical journals, um, journals like the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which is today the New England Journal of Medicine, to give you uh, the kind of sense of the sources that I'm talking about here. Occasionally, these journals would report cases of addiction before the Civil War, especially among um, one particular uh, demographic group, and that is white women, who tended to represent the, the, the I guess, the typical addicted people um, in the United States before the Civil War. And the reason for this has to do with antebellum medical thinking. Doctors during this time period believed that white women had um, naturally weaker bodies and were therefore more in need of pain relief and pain, pain relievers like opiates than other people. So they were per prescribed uh, and, or directed to take these medicines more frequently than other demographic groups. Um, coroner's records, if you look at coroner's records from places like uh, antebellum Charleston or New York City, where these records survive and have been recently digitized, these records reveal lots of overdose deaths before the Civil War, especially among this particular group of people, white, white women. Um, and so doctors knew, all of that is to say that doctors knew about addiction before the Civil War, but it didn't necessarily generate or raise um, significant alarm bells in the antebellum United States. Why? The reason for this has to do with antebellum gender conventions. So a lot of the, the, the story that I tell in my book um, has to do with ideas about how men and women uh, should behave and how their bodies functioned. Um, so according to antebellum cultural and medical ideas about, uh, about uh, white women, um, it was thought that white women were supposed to be more dependent um, on other people, other forces outside of themselves. Thus, when they became dependent on opium, when opium um, came to animate their days when they were addicted to it, uh, it was seen as like bad medically speaking, but not necessarily a huge violation of gender norms for the time period. It wasn't seen as a violation of the natural order. So all of that is to say that before the Civil War, before 1861, when the Civil War broke out in the U.S., um, there were uh, some cases of opiate addiction, but these were fewer in number. And these cases weren't necessarily seen as hugely problematic because of who uh, the people that were addicted to opiates were, the demographic group. Now, all of that changed with the Civil War. 
During the Civil War, opiate use among American men went off the charts. It skyrocketed. Um, the, the reason for this is that the Civil War was America's biggest ever health crisis up to that point in time. As a medical historian, I think of the Civil War not just as being a, a conflict over, over policies or a military conflict, but rather a con or, or a conflict over slavery, but rather um, a health crisis, right? It, it triggered this massive need for um, pain relievers and, and other medicines, right? So military surgeons during the Civil War doled out massive quantities of opiates to cope with this unprecedented influx of sickness and injuries among soldiers. Uh, according to one Confederate medical handbook, which was digitized by the National um, Library of Medicine as part of the uh, MHL, opiates were, quote, the most indispensable drugs on the battlefield, important to the surgeon as gunpowder to the ordinance. And I think that quote really gives a sense of how ubiquitous these medicines were and how important they were uh, during the Civil War. During the war, morphine injections were used to dull the pain of, of amputations like we see um, here in the image, and many men who survived amputations were naturally left in chronic pain. Therefore, they needed pain relievers for the rest of their lives. Um, opium pills were also used widely during the Civil War to suppress diarrhea. Um, opiates caused constipation, and so that was uh, a very important thing to do when you needed to keep men um, who were constantly suffering from diarrheal ailments basically on their feet and, and well enough to move as the armies moved around the United States. Um, some men also self-medicated with opiates to cope for anxiety or depression. So these were widely used medicines during the, the Civil War by soldiers uh, and widely prescribed by surgeons. Now, naturally, lots of men got addicted to opiates. Um, some men in Civil War hospitals during the wartime years and others through self-medication after leaving the army and returning home. So many veterans got addicted, in fact, that immediately after the Civil War, alarm bells went up across the country. Um, doctors, public health boards, journalists, um, even temperance reformers witnessed this huge uptick in addiction among um, ex-Civil War soldiers, Civil War veterans, as the armies demobilized and soldiers sort of spread out around the country. Some newspapers, like the New York Times, for example, in 1878, went so far as to label this crisis of addiction among um, former soldiers as an epidemic. So to quote the Times, quote, the evil of opiate addiction is like an epidemic. It is in the atmosphere of post-war America. It was a major public health problem then, just as it is now. So to sum up sort of where we've been, this is how the Civil War created uh, an epidemic of, of drug addiction that hit crisis levels very soon after the war ended in 1865. But what does that have to do with the Medical Heritage Library and mass digitization? Here for me, um, I'm sort of, I'm sort of uh, maybe too much into the methodology here. I could talk about the methodology and the sources for, you know, for days and days. Um, but here's, so, so that is to say that here's where our story really gets interesting from my point of view. Uh, from an evidentiary and methodological angle. Among historians of the Civil War, it, it's not exactly a secret that some veterans became addicted to opiates, but until now, until the era of mass digitization, uh, this knowledge has been mostly contained or relegated to the footnotes of, of monographs about Civil War medicine. So for example, during the progressive era, um, the early 20th century, uh, which is the period when in the United States um, the federal government first implemented these really restrictive narcotics policies that we have um, the legacy of today. Uh, during the, the early 20th century, some of the earliest um, public policymakers in the federal government to work on this problem, the problem of drug addiction, remembered uh, from their parents' generation that Civil War veterans had suffered um, opiate addiction at much higher rates than other people. So in hindsight, these progressive era um, public policymakers writing in the 1910s and the 1920s dubbed this epidemic of, of morphine and opium addiction, they called it the soldier's disease. Now, if you read basically any book published in the last hundred years or so since the progressive era on Civil War medicine or Civil War veterans or the, the health crisis of the Civil War, basically all of these um, volumes have these sort of oblique footnote style references to morphine addiction. But again, this is almost always um, something that's like relegated to the footnotes. It's never been something that's, that's investigated um, on its own, uh, for its own merits, right? Rather than a sustained investigation of the phenomenon, um, these references are universally one-offs and, and pretty much they're used to illustrate how supposedly backwards Civil War medicine was. Um, according to this line of thinking, surgeons were, were careless and they over-prescribed opiates and that's why um, veterans got uh, addicted. 
And that's essentially the work, uh, the extent of the, the work on this topic by scholars prior to mass digitization. No scholar before now uh, has ever been able to identify more than a handful of cases, and that has a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot to do with why um, there's been so little research on this topic. And this is because only uh, a few case reports, medical case reports, describing addicted Civil War veterans were ever published in the major medical journals of the Civil War era. Uh, and these were the kinds of sources that were readily available to um, uh, historians of 19th century America and Civil War medicine before now. So to give you an example, in the past, to research a topic like historical uh, drug abuse during the, the window of time that I'm looking at, historians had to uh, apply for a grant, get that grant, travel, to, uh, travel in person to uh, a physical medical library like those at Yale or the College of Physicians of Philadelphia or the National Library of Medicine. You had to flip through uh, a medical journal like this one, which is from uh, the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, and look for basically topical entries. These, this is sort of the easiest way to go about looking for uh, medical articles published in the, um, uh, in the United States before mass digitization. Uh, and that's how you theoretically would go about finding, uh, finding out about like, you know, tuberculosis or, you know, any other kind of, kind of medical problem, theoretically like opioid addiction. The problem with this method though, as I came to learn when I very first started this research several years ago, is that you won't find entries in these journal indices for things like opium addiction or morphine addiction or opium slavery. You just won't find that in the index. So uh, an alternative ap approach, a plan B, um, would be to flip through these Civil War era medical journals, again, journals like the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, um, and kind of look manually for articles or, or, or little snippets uh, of text that deal with this topic. But the problem that you face with, with this approach is that these journals span, um, anyone that's worked with them knows that these journals span thousands and thousands of pages of text per year, um, times, the, you know, times several hundred journals that were printed during this time period in the US. So this is kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, using this approach, looking through the indices or just flipping through the journals page by page, it would have taken decades and decades of research and a, a whole lot of institutional support to cobble together enough cases to, to, to support a monograph on the topic of opiate addiction among Civil War veterans. And actually the same problem um, is true of Civil War veterans letters and diaries, which are also ubiquitous in uh, American archives. These, these um, sources like letters and diaries, even though they exist basically everywhere, um, you won't find um, cases of opiate addiction uh, in the finding aids for, for these uh, kinds of sources. Uh, the reason for this is basically because Civil War veterans, it was so, opiate addiction was so stigmatized in the Civil War era US that Civil War veterans tended to mask or disguise their addictions whenever possible. They tried to refrain from writing about it openly in their letters. They tended to avoid doctors because they didn't want to be unmasked as being a quote, opium slave. Um, so this has created sort of uh, a kind of archival absence in traditional um, sources, what I like to think of as analog sources. There were, before now, there were too few sources to sustain a book on the subject, and of those sources that existed, the voices of veterans were also largely missing because they were um, crafted by uh, people who um, got a hold of, of addicted veterans, like judges and, and juries, things like that, right? So basically this silence, this archival silence means that if you try to approach this or try to investigate this subject using traditional analog sources, it's really impossible to uncover the extent of addiction among veterans, the social history of, of addiction, like the experience of addiction, and also the long-term um, ripple effects of this problem on uh, American drug policy or American medicine, right? You can't answer questions like, for example, how did addiction affect veterans' physical and emotional health? How did uh, addicted veterans see themselves? Um, for example, what toll did addiction take on their sense of manhood and their sense of honor? Um, how did veterans try to, to mitigate these effects? What kinds of um, self-treatments did they administer to cure themselves of opiate addiction? And also, how did doctors and the government respond? These are, things that, these are questions that we've never been able to ask and fully answer because of evidentiary and methodological problems. Um, basically, Civil War, until now, um, Civil War uh, historians view of this post-Civil War opiate addiction crisis has been stuck in a kind of limbo for about 100 years, uh, which is really unfortunate because this is a topic of tremendous relevance today amidst the opioid crisis that is ongoing in the United States. So enter the Medical Heritage Library. 
Um, over the last decade, scholarly groups like the Medical Heritage Library and also um, some genealogy companies like Ancestry.com and FamilySearch have digitized a huge array of printed and manuscript sources that speak to 19th century American medicine and health. So these sources have, a lot of them have been run through, have been digitized and run through optical character uh, recognition software, and they're now more accessible than ever through full text search tools. Um, and these are the kinds of sources that I've had to pivot to in order to really investigate the full story of the Civil War era opiate addiction crisis. So my, in my book, um, I pieced together uh, basically analog, non um, excuse me, analog traditional sources, things like mental asylum records, soldiers' homes records, with other kinds of, of mass digitized sources that have been unlocked by the Medical Heritage Library, things like medical journals from the 19th century, medical monographs, uh, medical product advertisements, medical pamphlets. So um, I guess uh, I think the most apt example for me are um, state medical journals. So if you go on the Medical Heritage Library um, website, one of the major data sets uh, is the state um, medical journals um, uh, collection, right? And so one, if you want to explore, for example, how uh, local bodies, uh, local public health bodies in the United States or local groups of physicians responded to opiate addiction in their communities uh, among veterans, these are the sources for you. Uh, and again, these are sources that have been sort of um, before now um, not readily accessible to scholars before the era of mass digitization. But now, I mean, I can pull up a, a, a state library um, medical journal uh, on the, the MLN, um, the, on the, excuse me, on the website and use, you know, it's as easy as typing in opium in the full text search bar and going through these, these sources. Um, when you do that, one of the things that you'll discover are that um, these medical journals dating from the late 19th century kept very detailed um, notes about medical society meetings that would occur periodically. And in these meetings, I've discovered American doctors addressed over and over again this topic of opiate addiction. They felt that they were being blamed for causing veterans addictions, and they debated how to re respond to that. They had, uh, by the way, they had really good reasons to be worried because um, in 19th century America, there were various different kinds of medical practitioners. And by no means did physicians uh, or, or those people who we think of as doctors today, didn't, um, they didn't have a corner on the medical marketplace. And other kinds of practitioners were also uh, deeply invested in um, this, this crisis that was occurring among Civil War veterans. Um, fortunately for me, the Medical Heritage Library has let me get a handle on how non-physicians also responded to opiate addiction. For example, these that you're seeing here on the slide are pamphlets that were published by a, a guy named uh, B.M. Woolley, who was a, a patent medicine manufacturer based out of Atlanta, Georgia after the Civil War. He invented um, what we would think of today as being a snake oil cure, um, and you see some of these floated around for opioid addiction today, these, these sort of um, things that you can buy and cure yourself of addiction theoretically. And so um, these were marketed by people like uh, Basil Woolley, BM Woolley, widely across the country um, in two, two Civil War veterans, um, oftentimes in pamphlet form. But here's the catch. Um, these pamphlets today are very, very rare. They were sort of the Gilded Age version of spam mail. They were something that people would read and then throw away or burn in the fireplace. And so as a consequence, they don't exist in very many archives. But fortunately enough for me, the Medical Heritage Library has digitized enough of these pamphlets that I've been able to piece together the story of, of how patent medicine makers responded to um, opiate uh, addiction. Jonathan, I'm giving you a two minute warning. Thank you very much. And that's perfect timing because I'll uh, conclude now basically by saying, uh, again, by reiterating the point that Without the Medical Heritage Library, the book that I'm doing would be literally impossible. Um, before now, before the era of mass digitization, Civil War historians had only ever found maybe a dozen cases of opiate addicted Civil War veterans. And that's just not enough to sustain a, a robust investigation of the topic. But now in this period of mass digitization, I can do this kind of, kind of research um, in uh, much more efficient ways. And that really unlocks uh, a bigger story that, that I'm able to tell here. So thank you. And now we will turn things over to Whitney. Wonderful. This has been a really wonderful conference and I'm, I'm so pleased to be included and to hear all the great work um, that is being done. And, um, and I'd like to talk about um, the work that I've done with the monthly review. So the title of my talk is Medicine in the Monthly Review, a large scale analysis of medical texts and discourses. 
And, um, and actually, before I begin, I'd like to note that this project would not have been possible without the Medical Heritage Library because of the, um, the 18th and 19th century texts that the monthly reviews, I would not have had access to them because this project involves close reading a lot of those texts. I'm really grateful for that. Um, so in this presentation, I will provide more detail about the monthly review and its cultural significance. I'll detail the topic modeling efforts to analyze the monthly review corpus, and I will post some preliminary insights from these topic modeling efforts about public medical discourse as presented by the monthly. So to begin, this project aims to uncover popular views of medicine and health in 18th and 19th century Britain through the periodical The Monthly Review, which, true to its name, was published monthly from 1749 to 1844. Roy Porter, among others, has pointed out within his realm of medical history the need to recover non-specialist views of medicine and health. And you can see, um, uh, well, and I'll talk about how The Monthly indeed reveals popular portrayals of medical knowledge. The Monthly participated in a public discourse of science and medicine. When it was founded in 1749, members of the public regularly attended medical lectures, demonstrations, and exhibits, as you can see here. Uh, scientific societies sprung up across the nation, newspapers detailed scientific advances, and medical books and journal articles proliferated. And also medical advances inspired a wide variety of cultural productions like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein famously. So as, as Roy Porter notes here in this quote on the slide, being familiar with medicine was not an individual and private matter, but integral to the public role of the well-informed, public-spirited, and responsible layman. So and in addition, when the publishing industry began its rapid expansion in the latter half of the 18th century, medical publishing, and this was publishing for both specialists and non-specialists, flourished. And, and this is where the monthly review comes in. So first appearing from uh, in May 1749 and then continuing until December 1744, the monthly review soon gained widespread popularity and with its format and content set a new standard for review journals. In comparison to other popular journals at the time, which occasionally contained lists of published texts or occasionally reviews of published texts along with many other items, the monthly review consisted solely of reviews of published texts. By the end of the 18th century, it was the most widely circulated periodical of its day, and James Boswell noted in his Life of Samuel Johnson that King George III of England specifically asked Samuel Johnson for his opinion of the monthly review. Booksellers often quoted from the monthly to sell their wares, believing the monthly to be very influential, and many accounts exist of authors' preoccupations with their reviews, the reviews of their work in the monthly. Among its subscribers, the monthly counted uh, such notable uh, leaders of government and prominent cultural figures like Edward Gibbon and Robert Southey, and its authors included Tobias Smollett, who um, then launched the, the Critical Review, a, a competing journal, uh, Isaac Disraeli, Oliver Goldsmith, David Garrett, and many others. Garrick, excuse me. In addition to being culturally influential, the monthly has proven to be a valuable record and archive of 18th and 19th century textual production due to the editor's stated aims of reviewing every published text. A note in the 1749 edition asserts, and you can see this on the slide, we propose for the future to register all new things in general without exception to any on account of their lowness of, of rank or price. So while the editor's aims of reviewing every published text ultimately proved impossible due to the rapid expansion of the, the publishing industry, over the course of the monthlies, almost 100 years and over 140,000 pages, it provided records of thousands of texts that are currently outside the scope of much of scholarly analysis. So the monthly's self-proclaimed role as a comprehensive archive and recorder of knowledge proves useful in analyzing medicine in its pages. Its reviewers included noted physicians and reviews of medical texts, which were geared towards both specialists and non-specialists proliferated. So of, of Everard Holmes' practical observations on the treatment of strictures in the urethra, which you can see here on the left, for instance, the reviewer of the monthly recommends it as a specialist text to quote, that class of readers for which they are designed, end quote, whereas the reviewer of George Wallace's The Art of Preventing Diseases advocates for a clearer explanation so that all readers may understand the text. So because the public often gained familiarity with medical texts solely through these reviews, the monthly had great power to influence public perceptions of the text and of the knowledge contained therein. 
Thus, due to the monthly's prominent place in British literary culture, analysis of its medically oriented texts and topics can valuably shed light on characteristics of popular medical discourse in the late 18th and early 19th century British public sphere. However, close reading its over 140,000 pages would be a formidable task. So, so for um, reference, this would be the equivalent to reading over, uh, over 280 different 500 page novels. Um, but this is where digital tools and machine learning provide assistance. So this this paper, with the, with the help of some wonderful UCLA collaborators, topic models the entire monthly review corpus by page. Through statistical topic modeling, we can read, and I put read in quotes, all 140,000 plus pages of the monthly review by generating topics, which are derived from contextual word co-occurrence patterns in the text, uh, essentially words that are regularly grouped together. Matthew Jockers and David Mimno have also characterized topics as themes, and I think this is another helpful way to think about topics, and I'll show examples in, in just a minute. Furthermore, the topics in the monthly directly identify critical discourses and they indirectly reflect the text themselves. Through topic modeling, we can discern the presentation and prevalence of various medical discourses in the monthly and map not only these discourses, but also how they fluctuated over the course of almost 100 years. So to go into a few technical aspects, um, the first part of this topic modeling experiment used the latent Dirichlet allocation or, or LDA topic modeling algorithm using the Mallet software package to fit 100 topics to the data set. And you can see the data set here it was 246 volumes over 140,000 pages and over 20 million words. And then from the resulting 100 topics, there were four specifically uh, medicine and anatomy related topics, which I include here. Um, so you can see, for instance, that topic two seems to relate more to medical practice, while topic three relates more to anatomy. Yet while the topics are interesting, they're still very general. So then in the second part of this experiment, uh, uh, the second part of the experiment isolated the monthly review pages that specifically contributed to these four medical review topics, including only the pages containing proportions greater than zero of one or more of these four medical topics. So you can see that the resulting data set consisted of 27,000 pages and over 4 million words. So one strength of examining the monthly review through topic modeling, as opposed to limiting the examination to reviews of medical texts um, in general, as if you would, you would close read it and look for only the reviews that were of medical texts, is that topic modeling brings to light medical discourse in all reviews, so of medical and non-medical texts. For instance, in an 1840 review that examines William Robert Wilde's narrative of a voyage to Madeira, which is pictured here, uh, which may just appear as a simple travel narrative, in fact, Wilde was a medical practitioner, and uh, he, he includes in the text, among other remarks, his observations on an Egyptian medical school and his corresponding recommendations for British medical education, and you can see his a quote here. Then another strength of topic modeling the monthly review is that it allows us to view larger trends that we can then complement with close reading methods. As is at times the case with methods of digital analysis and distant reading, these methods prove useful in identifying larger trends or characteristics that may not be visible to the human eye. And while they may not provide definitive conclusions, they can direct us to areas for further investigation. So it's in the spirit of investigation that I outline the following trends in the monthly's medical discourse that were suggested by the topic models. Taken as a whole, they shed light on public medical discourse as archived and transcribed by the monthly. So in the monthly, the focus on pathology is evident with disease being a prevalent term. Topics focusing on both general disease and specific ailments are included here. The words in these topics reflect diseases attracting widespread attention in the 18th and 19th centuries. And I wanna focus on two of these topics. You can see that topic six concerns what we would now call tuberculosis and topic seven concerns smallpox. And then we can map these topics over time to, review, uh, to reveal their presence in the monthly's discourse. So, here you see topics six and seven and their fluctuations over time. The, the smallpox topic, which focuses on inoculation and vaccination, demonstrates peaks at historically logical points with smallpox inoculations becoming more widespread in the 1750s and detailed in texts such as James Kirkpatrick's 1754, The Analysis of Inoculation. And then with 1798 marking the public announcement of the smallpox vaccine. So the monthly is really reflecting what is going on culturally. Um, whereas tuberculosis is often associated with the romantic period in literary scholarship, the topic's prevalence throughout the monthly shows its continual presence in public discourse. 
In addition, let's look at topics two, three, and four from the, the, from the group of disease-related topics. So topic three, we might characterize as a topic focusing on epidemics, and it remains rather stable with slight increases in the 19th century, but topics two and four exhibit wide variations. And if we look at topic two, we see the terms bleeding and humors, and it suggests a discourse of humoral theory. And indeed, if we close read these pages, the, the pages that contain the highest percentage of topic two, they include a 1759 review of William Hillary's observations on the changes of the air, which addresses both the acrid humors and the morbid humors and a 1751 review of Theophilus Lobb's Medical Principles and Cautions that gives preference to the effects upon the humors instead of upon the intestines. So the drastic decrease in this topic over time presumably reflects the cultural shift away from theories of the humors. While historians have noted evidence of this shift anywhere from the late 17th to the mid 19th centuries, topic modeling allows us to pinpoint more precisely when the shift occurred in the discourse of the monthly. In contrast, let's look again at topic four, which begins its rise in the 1780s and 1790s with great increases in the 1830s and 40s. So you see here the emphasis on organs, action, and function. And this suggests a localized concept of disease, with disease no longer identified by holistic symptoms, but observable by localized signs. And scholars have argued that this localized pathology gained ground in the early 19th century um, as the monthly's pages contributing to this uh, uh, sorry, the gain ground in the early 19th century and the monthly's pages contributing to this topic both, both show this but also problematize this. Because if we look at an 1836 review, for instance, of Yves Frédéric Dubois' Traité de Pathologie Générale, um, or Treatise of General Pathology, we see that the reviewer promotes this, this localized concept of disease while also faulting Dubois for presenting the older non-localized concept of disease. So the reviewer notes, and I'll, I'll read the quote, in investigating the nature of disease, it is as necessary to examine into the condition of the organs as into the derangement of functions it which they exhibit. The latter cannot, the latter cannot with propriety be um, considered as the author has apparently attempted independently of the former. So the monthly here not only documents the increasingly prevalent discourse of localized disease, but it points to contemporary debates and disagreements surrounding the topic, all of which contextualize the narrative of scientific change. Then I want to uh, share one more example. So um, the topics also suggest intriguing trends with regard to the practice of medicine. The topics included here are the three medical profession related topics um, that the topic model generated as well as their, their changes over time. I've numbered them starting with eight to distinguish from the, the seven disease uh, related topics we saw earlier. So you can see that while topics nine and 10 remain relatively stable with topic 10 increasing a bit in the late 1830s, topic eight declines drastically over the course of the monthly review. And a clue to these differences is in the topics themselves. So while topics nine and 10 address the medical profession more broadly in terms of its larger professional and, um, and academic structures, topic eight suggests a focus on patients and their treatment with the words cases, with what looks like cafes, but is most likely or, or is an OCR error um, resulting from the long S in the 18th century. So it's again cases and the word remedy. So this decrease inpatient focus topic eight is even more intriguing than when compared with topics 11 and 12 included here and mapped over time. So like topic eight, topic 11 also suggests a focus on the patient and its terms such as time hours and violent point to a more narrative structure oriented towards case histories. So this is intriguing. If we look at the pages that contain the highest percentage of topic eight, the patient focused topic, we see this, this focus indeed on patients' accounts and case histories. We can see um, one of the pages in topic eight, for instance, concerns uh, the 1786 review of Henry Fearon's treatise on cancers. And you can see in the quote here that the slide that the review, or you can see in the quote here that the reviewer judges Fearon's methods regarding the treatments of cancers as a success because of the individual case studies that Fearon includes. So this is the evidence um, that he cites as successful. In the preface of the third edition of the text, Fearon himself adds, um, notes that he has made the third edition even more perfect by the addition of several important cases. 
Then concerning, concerning topic 11, the pages in this topic are narrative case histories with one of the top pages, for instance, being this 1750 review of John Huxham's an essay on fevers. You can see here the narrative that he provides of the, the eminent surgeon who fell into a slow fever. So significantly then, the two topics, eight and 11, that draw attention to individual patients and ailments decline notably in the 19th century, which suggests a shift away from patient-focused narrative discourse in the monthly review. What's interesting, one thing that's interesting in his linguistic analysis of the, the specialist periodical, the Edinburgh Medical, Edinburgh Medical Journal, Dwight Atkinson observes that whereas the journal's mid 18th century reports tended to present singular cases in a narrative structure, its later 19th century reports often presented multiple cases together in more abstract and quantitative terms. So the monthly's topics reveal this shift that Atkinson is describing on a large and public scale, um, expanding Atkinson's analyses of practitioners and specialists by suggesting that a larger cultural change evident in the depiction of medicine in the non-specialist sphere as well, as the monthly is addressing. So, so in conclusion, the monthly really helpfully provides a record of almost 100 years of reviewing and publishing. And examining the monthly's culturally influential text sheds light on public discourse about medicine and health in late 18th and early 19th century Britain. Topic modeling proves to be useful in revealing the monthly's trends in its writing about medicine, as well as in the text that the monthly reviewed. And the trends that I've noted in this presentation have pertained to specific diseases, theories of medicine and pathology, and narratives of illness or case histories. So I would like to give special thanks to the UCLA Digital Research Accelerator, as well as uh, specifically Benjamin Niedzielski, Nick Schweiderman, and Tara Jones. And I've included my contact information here, and I, I welcome questions and comments. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. I, there, I, I can only imagine just listening to you and Jonathan that there are generations of historians who envy the access that we have today. Um, Jonathan, there are an, a couple of questions for you. First question is how much uh, medical opiate administration increased I'm sorry, how much do you think the um, increase in opiate use among white women uh, increased the death rate during the antebellum period? Mm -hmm. I made that's a, that. That's, that's a good question. I think, so, so I think I understand um, what the question is asking. And I, I'll say that I think that um, one of the things that uh, I've also, you know, one of the digitized resources that I've also really benefited from um, are coroner's reports. There are a couple of, um, pre-Civil War cities, like I mentioned in the, in the presentation, uh, New York City and Charleston, have these um, amazing uh, coroner's records that, uh, where coroners investigated suspicious deaths, including lots of women who overdosed on laudanum and, and opium and, and um, other opiate medicines, right? And so um, these kinds of records speak to a really high death toll. For example, uh, I quantified um, a range, like a 10-year range in the, uh, between the mid-1840s and mid-1850s of overdose deaths in New York City and of like 1800 or something, about 1800 um, recorded deaths, like 5% of them were um, opiate overdoses and the vast majority of those were um, white, white women. And it's, it, you know, it's hard to tell some of the demographic factors like their class, for example, um, but uh, um, oftentimes in these coroner's reports, their race was mentioned, their sex was mentioned, um, or you can tell by, by the person's name. So these are um, another example of mass digitized sources that, that have really helped me um, peel back the layers of this topic. Like before mass digitization, um, it was known to scholars that people occasionally died of opiate overdoses, but who those people were, we didn't know. Um, and so mass, dig mass digitization has really helped um, uh, shine, a, shine a light into that. Um, Jonathan, another question um, asks how Civil War veterans were taking morphine. Were they doing it in a consistent manner and were they smoking it? Was it oral? Was it intravenous? That's a great question. The, the, uh, all the above is the short answer. <laughs> um, so, well, all the above except for smoking, I will say. Um, so for um, most of the 19th century, until you get into the, the, very, the last couple of decades of the 19th century, um, uh, um, most Americans, um, people who were born in the United States, did not smoke opium. Um, opium smoking was introduced into the West Coast 
in the mid-century, and it wasn't until the late 19th century that um, uh, non-immigrant Americans started smoking opium, basically. So most Civil War veterans who uh, were addicted consumed their drugs every day through things like injections. They would uh, inject themselves with morphine, and you could buy, uh, again, you could buy a bottle of morphine at your local general store. You could order it in the mail. You could buy um, a mail, uh, you could buy a, a hypodermic needle kit for like a dollar in the mail. Um, I think Sears at one point actually carried these kits. So if you look at an old Sears catalog, you can find them. Uh, that was one way. I think the more common way that, that people consumed, uh, Civil War veterans consumed these drugs, were opium pills. Um, at one point, I tried to sit down and, and quantify the, the kinds of ways that people um, consumed opiates, and that's really hard to do. But um, uh, the bottom line is that most people, uh, most Civil War veterans, would actually swallow opium. Uh, and so one of the contemporary descriptors for um, opium addict was opium eater back then, literally because they would oftentimes eat um, opium Pills, and also you could you could buy uh, morphine in pill form back then too. So very little opium smoking, but lots of oral uh, and injection uh, consumption. And what, one other question for you, Jonathan, was the rate of alcoholism higher or equal to or lower than opiate addiction? Much higher. Oh, it was among much Civil War veterans. Yeah, among Civil War veterans. This is one of the interesting things. Um, we we don't have a, a good. Um, really rich study of alcoholism among Civil War veterans. Yet, it's another one of those topics where you have a, a lot of one-off references in history books about the Civil War to soldiers drinking a lot to cope with the job or veterans going home and becoming alcoholics and getting thrown in jail for that. Um, but we still lack uh, a really uh, detailed, sophisticated study of, of what that meant for veterans. Um, uh, but with that said, we do know that the alcoholism rate among all Americans was vastly higher than the opiate addiction rate. Um, there's a scholar named David Courtright who a while back um, went and quantified the addiction rate. Uh, and it was um, about three times lower, I think, uh, if I'm remembering his numbers correctly, than um, the current addiction rate is in like New York State, for example. So um, first of all, many less people were addicted to opioids back then as now. And um, back then, uh, vastly more Americans were addicted to whiskey and, and other forms of alcohol than opiates. But with that said, um, the American government, uh, doctors, they were terrified about the opium problem because it was um, something that uh, uh, had a lot of cultural baggage around it that was more, um, more even, even more controversial, in my opinion, than the alcohol problem. So that's a long answer to a short question, but uh, a lot more alcoholism, but opium addiction was really, really bad. Whitney, I'd like to ask you how you came to study medical texts. Um, so, yeah, well, I started out analyzing the monthly review because I was fascinated in the sort of um, paratextual elements of text. So not only what is in the text, but what is said about the text. Mm -hmm. um, and I came to the examining the medical aspects because of my other work on autobiographical texts. I, um, I, you know, a lot of the autobiographical, excuse me, autobiographical texts I'm studying, people talk about their health, which of course makes perfect sense because your your health impacts your presentation of the self mm -hmm. in the text. And so I, I've been pursuing that line of inquiry and I was really curious with regard to the medical review since the other area I, I study is publishing history, how this worked um, with the the um, the medical review. So that's what led me to, to medicine specifically. Another question, um, and, and this comes from Kim Adams, who's one of our moderators and who is not a specialist in this period. How influential was the monthly review? How widely read was the publication? And how influential was it, particularly in medical discourse? Great question. So it was, it was very widely read. Um, to the point, well, so it's interesting, right? We may think about what was read at the time because of course not all of the population was literate. It was it was a subsection of the population. So, and, and then not all the population could afford to subscribe to the monthly mm -hmm. review, but the monthly was then, um, it was, read in coffee shops. Um, it was read to others aloud. So the actual number of people who read, quote unquote, the monthly review is actually pretty extensive um, for a review. So it was, it did, was the periodical with the widest circulation of its day. Um, 
And, uh, and you see, for instance, Frances Burney dedicated Evelina, her novel Evelina, to the, to the authors or the editors of the monthly review as well as the critical review, the, the competing journal. And you just see in a lot of um, notable authors of the day preoccupations with the monthly, like, oh, has the review come out? Has the review come out? So they're wondering how their work is going to be reviewed. And then with regard to um, medicine, it, it's interesting because most of the readership was not reading these actual medical texts. They were reading these descriptions of the medical text. So in that way, the monthly was had a lot of power to influence public discourse about medicine and what was being published. And um, the, of course, there were a number of specialist medical journals at the time. And studies have shown that in the more, more general journals like the monthly, that, that uh, reviews of medical texts tended to go down over time, especially into the, the 19th century, as they sort of focused on other things and, and figured that medicine was the domain of specialist journals. But the monthly, if we topic model the discourse, we can see that actually the monthly reviews of medical texts and discussions of medicine and health did not really drastically decline. So the monthly is interesting in that way, in that it, it kept up its discourse of medicine. And this was how uh, a number of people consumed the medical texts that were being published. Thank you. I have one last question for, for Jonathan. Um, how did the Civil War related opium crisis relate to anti-Chinese propaganda and legal efforts in the late 1900s or probably late 1800s? This is uh, another really good question, and it's one that I'm still still unpacking uh, as I as I revise uh, my book. But basically, the, the bottom line is that um, when we think sort of in hindsight, you know, um, opium addicted person in the 1800s, our minds tend to jump to um, these sort of pop culture images of of Chinese immigrants smoking opium in like a, an opium den or an opium joint in Chinatown in New York City or San Francisco, right? And so uh, towards, the reason that we think that is because towards the, the latter half of the 1800s, there was a lot of, of um, among white Americans, popular um, fascination and also I guess like horror at um, the, the, the a, a alleged problem of, of Chinese immigrants smoking opium in these, these um, spaces, right? And so um, basically what that's done in hindsight has made us think sort of like when we imagine back into the 1800s and we try to think about opium in retro, uh, opium addiction in retrospect, we tend to think that all um, uh, Americans who were addicted to opium were also opium smokers. Um, in reality, that's not, not true. Uh, the reality is that um, Chinese opium smokers represented a minority of the people that were addicted to opiates in the United States back then. But um, their, their influence was really important on like white discourse about the problem because um, for like decades and decades, American missionaries, American doctors wrote about this problem of Chinese opium addiction, both in China and in uh, places where Chinese immigrants lived in the United States. And they uh, wrote about like how morally wrong um, opium smoking was and how it uh, uh, one of the, the phrases that they would often use is that opium smoking degraded the person. And what that meant is that it made them a bad person, like morally bad. That bled over into the medical discourse about Civil War veterans who injected morphine. They all of a sudden took on the, the characteristics of the Chinese opium smoker. So one of the things that I argue in my book is that for um, predominantly white male Civil War veterans, they lost some of those claims to whiteness, which, which had a lot of... Um, cultural um, you know, baggage that went along with it. And, and I'll tie that into absolutely the very last question. Um, you mentioned the use of the term opium slave. Mm -hmm. um, and how was that term used in context uh, with American slavery? And what does it mean for white men to become enslaved to opium in a war about freeing black slaves? That's the, that's the kicker, right? The, so, so, um, in, um, so, so there are aspects uh, about um, opioid addiction that we are able to understand that um, in the 19th century, doctors and also just people, um, uh, you know, general, you know, people in the United States weren't able to understand. Um, and one of the, the things that they, uh, that we use today that they didn't necessarily use very often is the word addiction, right? And so, um, but they understood the concept. So they were sort of searching around for a way to describe what they were seeing, which was addiction without the word addiction. And so they settled on this descriptor of slavery to opium, opium slavery. Um, they got it basically from uh, chattel slavery in the South and also from the temperance movement, which liked to describe people as slaves to the bottle, which is a, a phrase that probably a lot of us have heard. Um, and so that influenced, um, I forget where I'm going with this, but that influenced the way that people thought about opium, uh, white Civil War male um, opium addicts, right? It was thought that, for example, 
um, to be a, a black person enslaved in the South before the Civil War was to be, you know, it was thought that you were dependent on your master. That was one of the tropes that came out of slavery, um, literal slavery. Well, that carried over into opium slavery for white men. And so again, back to this idea that being called a slave when you're actually a white man in an era uh, of slavery and emancipation is basically an insult. It's, it degrades your whiteness. It degrades the, the, your ability to say that you, know, you are um, a white man. And so um, it was a cultural construct that sort of chipped away at opiate addicted veterans' masculinity and their whiteness. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Whitney, for wonderful presentations.